All right. Well, we're on it. So first, I just want to thank everybody for uh, your interest in Deduce. Um, today is a special session focused just on the analysis workspace. So if you are new to Deduce, you're certainly um, welcome to hang out, although some of the, the building of a project might remain a little mysterious unless you or until you join one of our other sessions. Or So I'm going to hope that most of you have touched Deduce and then We'll kind of just kind of go through things uh, step by step. Um, I have a couple of slides that I like to sh shoot through just to um, drive home sort of what we're thinking about as we as we design deduce and as we carry out our mixed methods work. Um, and then uh, I will jump into the application and we will spend our time in mostly the analysis workspace, maybe a little bit of filtering. All right, I guess we better get on that screen. So um, from the very beginning, I mean, Deduce is distinguished from some of these other traditional qualitative data analysis packages in, in a number of ways. But um, from the very beginning when we designed it, we were really thinking about not just addressing traditional qualitative data uh, analysis and interaction and searching and retrieving, but really in mixed methods, because that's the kind of work that we were doing at UCLA. And we support um, many projects that are engaged in the sort of mixed methods work. So doing ethnographies or interviewing people, but also in the context of surveys and things like that. So from the very beginning, when we built the, our, the, the, the system itself, we were really thinking about how do we manage all of these different kinds of data and allow people to interact with them in ways that are familiar to their, their training and tradition. So this is just a really simple, uh, you know, an oversimplified schematic of sort of what we're what we're dealing with, right? So this column on the left side, those are our qualitative data. We develop code systems, we apply them, and then we search and filter and extract um, sets of excerpts to carry out our interpretation and weave our stories. From a traditional uh, quantitative perspective, things are a little bit more in a straight line, right? So in a in a common study we might um, have existing measures that we're using we can have our analysis plans already laid out before we even gather our data as opposed to the sort of more iterative process when we're dealing with qualitative data and one of the things that was introduced to me oh but so in, in thinking about bringing all these kinds of data into the system um, it's only very recently actually that we've implemented pure quantitative features and I'm, I'm excited to show you those today. Um, another thing that we deal with in terms of numbers in Deduce is, uh, is using a code weight or rating system. And the idea here is that um, it's often the case that when we look at data that we've coded with a particular code, there's some variation within that set. So if we look at excerpts where we're talking to mothers about reading to their children, which is the demo project I'll be showing you, or one of the projects. If we look at all the excerpts where mom's talking about reading to her, ch her child, what we were able to see in that particular study was variation in the quality of the episodes that these kids were experiencing. So not only do we have all of the, the rich uh, variation and depth of what the mothers are reporting from a qualitative perspective, but we're also able to lay out these excerpts across a dimension to represent quality. Um, this was key to some of the things that we were doing at UCLA, uh, or it was developed before I even arrived there over 20 years ago. Um, it was exciting to me because I'm traditionally trained as a quantitative person and uh, sort of learn more of the qualitative and mixed methods as I launched into my professional career. So one of the really cool things about these grounded dimensions is that we can analyze them from traditional quantitative perspectives. So we can look at the distributions, um, how they vary across subgroups. We can also integrate them into other traditional quantitative analysis. So if we're collecting data that represents um, demographics, scale scores, ratings, and things like that, we can integrate these dimensions that came out of the qualitative data, okay? We call them grounded dimensions because they really are lifted up from the population that we're studying in a particular project, okay? And so when we can do this then, we have this connection between the qualitative data and what we've learned there and some of the quantitative data that are essentially disconnected. So when we're exploring our data from different perspectives, we may learn things from the qualitative data um, that we can transform into uh, demographic variables and things like that and analyze them in very traditional quantitative ways. And similarly, when we have 
uh, results from a quantitative analysis that sometimes leave us wondering if we have a different correlation for males versus females on a couple of variables, we often don't have anything else to sort of tease that apart. But when we have these connections to the qualitative data, we can then return to what we've learned from the qualitative perspective because we know so much more about these people than the simple uh, results from a quantitative scale, okay? So this is, this is truly a barroom napkin model that Tom Weisner and I started to build when I first arrived at UCLA, and it's, it's, it's a lot cleaner now than it used to look. But um, I think it, it illustrates how we can flow back and forth and transform data, not just in terms of uh, data reduction approaches from a, a, a coding perspective, but to develop these grounded dimensions as well, which introduces super interesting uh, dimensions to your project and it lets you do some really interesting things analytically. All right, are we good? Still out there? It's always a little surreal when you're talking to a computer screen. So um, I'd like to illustrate the connections that we're building within a project. Because when I first started to talk to people about qualitative data analysis software packages, people were looking for the magic, right? Where's the button that you push that does something, okay? So people particularly who come from quantitative perspectives are looking for something that's under the hood. Some uh, correlation is going to be calculated and the results are going to be presented to you. But with most of these tools, that's really not what we're doing. So um, at Deduce, we're really trying to get away from the traditional uh, ways of describing these software packages as, as qualitative data analysis software and really talking about it in terms of research pardon me and evaluation data apps okay because we're we're, we're driving the ship here as as investigators okay so um in terms of some of the language in deduce if you're not already familiar we can import uh, what we call descriptor data okay so here we have a spreadsheet that represents variation in our individual participants in a study we then collect our qualitative data. And these are connections that, that you, can, you can establish automatically, but often we can do them um, on a manual basis as well. Okay, so these relationships between the, the qualitative media and the participant information itself is really important because that's what the tool then capitalizes on in terms of how you move through your data and, and then analyze them, okay? We can also have sec uh, separate sets of descriptors that might represent different levels of analysis. So this is an illustration of how we have participants that are nested you know, in different schools, okay? Um, finally, what do we do? Build out our code system, right? This is the heavy intellectual work that you as investigators bring to your data. And then you go in and you create excerpts within the qualitative media, tag them with any number of codes, use the code weights. And it's through the, the, the this web of connections that you've established in a project that lets the analytic features and deduce help you search, filter, visualize using all aspects of the database, okay? Are you, can I can I get a hello on the questions panel, especially for those of you that just checked in a little late? Um, there is a questions panel in the GoToWebinar widget, and so I welcome you to uh, post things to me as uh, as as needed. Thank you, Cindy. All right. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out there are lots of resources. We are actively putting together little video snippets. You'll see them sometimes in our blog. Uh, the video tutorials, the user guide has lots of other little video snips uh, as well so that you can actually see things in action. And most exciting to us is we've got a book coming out uh, this fall. Uh, we just delivered uh, to Sage, and so it is going into production as we speak. So keep your eye out for that. It's really far beyond uh, a user guide. We have all kinds of illustrative case studies um, written by uh, really prominent researchers to, to describe how they use deduce um, to really sort of bring it to life in, in real um, research settings. Okay, so, all right, so let's get out of here and jump into deduce. All right. So I'm going to be poking into three different projects. The first is the demo project that if you've used Deduce, um, you may be familiar with. Um, these are data that come from a study we did uh, looking at families with children in Head Start programs. So as that example of reading by mom, that's obviously one of our codes because we were looking at the literacy environment, wanting to get a sense about um, how these families 
uh, differ across different kinds of dimensions, the resources that they have, the kinds of routines that they're engaged in that support literacy development in the young children. Okay, so that's where these data come from, just to put a little context around it. All right. Here is our analyzed workspace. And uh, again, if you're not yet familiar with Deduce, we have all of our analytic features organized in this folder structure here on the left. Um, no problem, Michael, happy to have you. Um, and so I'm gonna just kind of go down the list in each section and we'll look at some of the major uh, charts and, and graphs and things that are available to you, okay? So I'm, gonna, I'm certainly not gonna hit all of them because we don't have enough time to do that. Um, but let's just start looking at excerpt count by media files. So here's all of our media listed here. Um, and uh, if you're not already familiar, virtually everything in Deduce can be exported to an appropriate format. So if there's a visual that helps you tell a story, you certainly want to go ahead and just click the export icon here in the upper right corner. Um, you'll have different kinds of options. So we can look at this as a bar chart, or perhaps we want to look at it as a pie chart. Um, and then all of the aspects of the visuals in Deduce um, are hot linked to the underlying data. Because ultimately what we're doing is wanting to visualize, to seek patterns, to communicate those patterns. But we're always going to want to drill underneath the, the, the surface so that we can tell the, the story around the richness that uh, is represented in the qualitative data. So I can just click this piece of the pie, for example, and it's going to pull up all of the excerpts from this particular media file. Okay. All right, this is the excerpt count by media. Here is an example of code count. So we can look and see how many code applications have been applied uh, within a particular media file. Here is your code application table. So this is just a grid that gives us counts. And then we can use the totals column and uh, pull up, for example, all of the excerpts from this particular file or just the excerpts that were tagged with a particular code in a given file. <laughs> and Irene is asking if all the hot links are created automatically. Yeah, absolutely. So when, um, uh, when you're going through, assuming that the connections that, that I illustrated are in place, then whenever uh, you're looking for sets of excerpts that might have been coded uh, with a particular code um, from a particular subgroup, all of the, that is happening under the hood. So as you're establishing these connections, there are keys that link all of that information together. Uh, here we can look at variation by user. I'm the only person on this project that created anything. And this is a code present absent table. And so here what we were looking for, or users had asked us to create this, was similar to code applications. Um, it's the same grid, but it's just going to be ones and zeros because people wanted to have a visual representation of they didn't care how many times a particular code was used. They just wanted to know whether it was used or not for a particular media file. Um, and this is an example of something that um, we came to later on uh, as a result of people, you know, hitting us at support and saying, hey, I like a table that shows this. Um, we receive requests, I wouldn't say all the time, but regularly and anytime somebody comes to us with a, a, an idea that we think is going to serve some broad swath of our user community we're going to absolutely build it in um, and so that said i should probably also mention that um, there are going to be many things in deduce that that you may never use um, because it may not be the way that you want to do your work or the way that you want to move through your data so uh, when we first built deduce Tom Weisner and I got our wish list uh, addressed, um, but over the years now, people have come to us with, with useful ideas, and so we've continued to build it out. Um, and that's why, actually, we're kind of hosting this kind of a, a, a topical webinar, because um, sometimes it takes a while to get familiar with all the things that are in there, uh, so that when you're doing your work, it's going to be more efficient for you. You'll be able to more quickly get to those uh, particular analytic features that are going to be most useful to you. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is that um, you're going to see some of the same uh, analytic features in different folders, depending on what aspect of the database you might see. So for example, we have our code application table for the media file, and you're going to see that same table here because codes are involved as well. All right. So let's take a look at descriptor information. Let me close this folder. 
So here's your descriptor ratio of pie charts. So you can get a quick look at um, you know, the percentage of a population that sits within a particular demographic or other kinds of fields. So one of the things that I wanted to point out here um, very quickly, which is a little off topic, um, is that we can create filters anytime we pull up sets of excerpts. So for example, um, if you're interested in looking at uh, analyzing data just for male children, for example, okay? So I'm gonna click this piece of the pie. It pulls up all the excerpts that came from families reporting having male children, okay? So anytime we see this pop-up where we have the results of, of a click-through, we can have this make active set down here at the bottom. And this is a really simple, fast way of activating filters. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And so now that filter is bound to the entire data set. And a really quick look here, and you'll be able to see the results of, of the impact or the impact of that filter. So let's pull up child gender. And you can see now in these bar charts, we only have data for the male family participants, okay? Um, filters are, are powerful. You can create them in a, in a number of different places. We'll probably have to do a separate uh, topical webinar filtering. Um, and one thing to be aware of is that when a filter is active, excuse me, <clears throat> there's two visual cues in deduce. One is this little funnel icon is gonna appear here in the panel header for lots of, in lots of different places. And that serves as a toggle. So I can toggle the filter off and toggle it back on so that I can see the impact. Also, you'll see that this data set icon in the main menu bar shaded red. So that's just a, a, another kind of in your face, hey, there's a filter active because one of the most distressing calls that we get from support is people calling up and you can hear in the background, they're alarmed, they don't know what happened to their data. And I hear one of the support people say, is the data set icon shaded red? So people will activate filters not having realized what they've done and they don't wanna to touch it because they don't know where their data is or they're afraid to use it. So our, our support team become heroes because all the data are apps usually not impacted at all. All right, dataset workspace is also where you, it's one of the places that you can create filters and I'm gonna deactivate this one. Uh, you can also save them. So whenever a filter is active, you can save it down here in your library. And then even as you add new data to a project, you can come back in here and highlight the filter of interest and then load it and then you're back right where you were. All right. Here's a different look at a grid chart. So here we're looking at um, the number of uh, cases in each of the categories. So let's make this a little simpler. Just do gender again. And so now for all of our other fields, we're looking at the number of uh, participants within a particular set as broken out by male or female. Okay, so here's, we have seven male participants. This is not, not your ID. That, that range isn't particularly useful. So you can see 100% of the females are in the female category. Here we've broken out by ethnicity, phases of the study, languages reading at home. Okay, so it's another um, kind of useful look at the number of participants in each of these subgroups. Um, and then we can, of course, click through to pull up all associated excerpts. So here are all the, um, I think I clicked on male Spanish speaking, okay. All right, we already took a look at codes by descriptor here. So this is just, um, again, I have two sets here. Um, so let's pull up the reading by mother code for child gender, okay. So now we have all of our codes listed here. Our charts that represent the frequency, we've used the particular code in each of the subgroups. And here's one place I just wanna point out the use of the weight system, okay? Because these are giving us frequency counts here, which may or may not be useful to you in your analysis. Um, because sometimes if you were coding data in flowing interviews, for example, um, it may be that um, Cindy likes to talk about reading to her children. So there's gonna be five different excerpts in that interview where you've used the code reading by mother. Um, Eli, on the other hand, doesn't like to talk a lot about it. I, I mentioned it once and that's enough, okay? So um, in, in that kind of a, a study, we, we can't overinterpret the number of uh, excerpts that were tagged with a particular 
code because it's just going to vary as a function of the method itself. If I toggle this to a weight chart, however, now what we're looking at is the average weight across all the participants. So we've, we've taken all the excerpts. So if, if Cindy talked about reading to her child five times, she only gets represented once here in terms of the average quality that we, we gleaned from the different excerpts. Whereas for me, also, there's just simply one number. So this sometimes is a more valid uh, uh, type of visual. Um, and again, it just gives us a look at, you know, for each subcategory, What's the relative quality? Here is a question of the length of duration. So it looks like male child families are reading some somewhat longer periods of time than uh, for female child families. All right, so there's your code by descriptor. Here's sort of the flip side. We've got descriptor by code here. So again, you just have to be thinking as, as I kind of poke through all these, and it's gonna, it's going to be a little bit like drinking from the fire hose as I kind of go through this. If that, um, but what I'm hoping is, is that as we sort of poke through here, it'll the, a trigger will go off for each one of you at least a number of times, saying that's something that's useful to me in the way that I think about analyzing my data. Um, Irene is asking what kind of manipulation options are there for descriptor charts? Really, just bar, I think if we're talking about here, we just simply have pie or bar charts here as, as your options there. Hope that's speaking to your question. Um, all right, one more here, or maybe two more. I'm gonna jump around a little bit because I wanna use uh, other projects to be illustrating some of the other features. So here, let's look at, um, I'm gonna look at participant, look at child gender, by population density here and a particular code. So this is more of a cross tab view. So here we're bringing in two of our descriptor fields and then looking at variation um, as coded information and similar to just the sort of unidimensional code by descriptor. All right, so I'm gonna show you one more here in this project and then I'm gonna jump to another project. This is your code co-occurrence matrix. And what we're looking for here, um, and this is something that we use on a relatively frequent basis in our work, is we're looking for patterns in how the participants are reporting to us around the things that we're interested in. Um, a really interesting example of how this really helped us in a study was we were interviewing um, Asian immigrant families with young children, and we spoke to both mothers and fathers. And so as we sort of went through and coded the data, um, and, and I should mention that uh, your default here is overlapping excerpts. So what we're looking for is, is when people are talking about one of our themes of interest, are they also talking about other themes and, and, and learning about how they connect those ideas. And so in this study with uh, parents of young children, we were interviewing the mothers and what we saw in the co co-occurrence matrix was when they were talking about childcare activities like bathing, changing diapers, feeding, they were also talking about relationship building and warmth and comforting and things like that. Um, so they were connecting these things sort of uh, from a nurturing standpoint. And when we asked the dads about these childcare activities, it was the, 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 the simple way of saying is dads were saying, sure, I change diapers and I bathe the child and I take out the trash and I do the dishes. So the dads, when they were reporting about these child care activities, they were talking more about in the, in the context of just tasks um, in terms of that managing the home. So when we looked at this matrix, the pattern was strikingly different and it really kind of helped us see just in the way that they were thinking about these things um, as a function of their, their gender. Um, I guess we can look at one more here. Let's look at code weight statistics. Um, so if you do use the weight system, it's you're, you're going to want to somehow take a look at some of the psychometric characteristics. And so here's where we get a, a quick glimpse of that. Um, and it's asking about the patterns here. Okay, so so what we're looking at here is, and and I should mention that with all of the tables where we have frequencies. Um, frequency is mapped to the color spectrum. So your reds are gonna be more frequent and your blues less. And that way your eye is gonna sort of go to where some of the action is. So, so imagine, Anna, that we had um, 
uh, you know, child care activities, so bathing and feeding, um, as well as other types of, of chores and other aspects of the homes, nur nurturing and uh, comforting and things like that. So we, we saw more frequent connections between these child care activities and the nurturing things for the mothers. But then when we, so we filtered first by gender. So we looked at this matrix just for the, the mothers saw the patterns that were emerging there. Um, we can explore them simply clicking on the cell to dig into the qualitative data. So we could sort of see the stories as they were emerging there. Then we filtered moms off, turned on dads, looked at the same matrix, and the pattern was, was just really different. So that was sort of how we uh, teased that apart as a function of the parent's gender. Um, all right. Let me pause here and see if there's any other questions um, about what we've covered so far. All right, so I'm going to get into some of our fancier stuff. Yes, we filtered by, by gender in this case, but you can filter based on anything. Um, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at our grid chart. So this, this grid chart is um, a customizable, you can basically just pull in which fields you're interested in and which codes. So for example, if we're interested in, uh, I'm gonna go for child gender, I'm gonna add that field, uh, mom's reading language, and select a code here you can see that we're starting to populate. So here we can see now in these sort of subgroups, so we can see females, how frequently do we use reading by mother, female, child families with Spanish speaking moms, bilingual moms and English moms, and similarly for the male. And so you can continue to build out this matrix depending on which of the codes that you're interested in looking at for a particular uh, investigation. And Michael's asking, weighting is about average frequency across data set. No, the weight feature, and I mentioned this maybe before you joined us, the weight feature allows you, and I can show you what that looks like. It allows you to introduce a numerical dimension. So here for the reading by mother code, for example, I'm just going into edit the code, um, is we can, we can activate the code weight feature allow decimal places, set minimum, maximum values, and defaults. And so these are custom scales that you can develop um, and uh, allows you to introduce this new dimension to, um, to your data um, by distributing based on, in, in this case, the quality, um, frequency, the, the, the salience, um, how uh, important something might be. So um, people use these in really imaginative ways, and it can, and really can uh, allow you to sort of just look at your data in entirely new ways and move through your data. I guess while we're in here, I will show you one of our frequency charts. Now, this is only a five-point scale, so we're not seeing a lot of range here. Um, but what this does is it lets us look at all the psychometric characteristics for this weight scale. And I can decide how many clusters I want across the distribution. Um, and then I can also drill through. So say, for example, I'm interested in looking at all of the excerpts where we use reading by mother and we decided that quality was relatively high. So now I can just click this bar and move through from that numeric dimension into the qualitative data. And then I might back out and select the low end and see how things vary based on what we interpreted as quality. So yes, Michael, you would assign the numbers um, as you move through your data. Although there's actually kind of a cool feature built in. And I'll see if I can have an example here. Um, where if, yep, let me pull up a document here. I'm gonna just make this happen. Okay, so here we have, for example, a number in, the text here. So there's a four up there. I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm going to apply the reading by mother code to that number. And if you look up here where we've applied the code, the, the weight, because the default weight for reading by mom is five, but in this case, it automatically sets the value. So there was an interesting use case 
um, basically it was an NGO that's, that was looking at reports that were coming to them from the different programs that they had funded. And they wanted to, to be able to pull out and tag across like $250,000. And they would just go into these reports and they'd code them for like dollars spent on a program. And the weights got set for them automatically as they did that. And then they were able to look at these distributions and start looking at where they were getting, you know, good results for the money that they were investing in these different programs. So that's kind of a cool thing that many people aren't aware of. Um, and it's kind of idiosyncratic in terms of uh, when you might use it, but it's, it's in there. Um, all right. So let me take you to another project that I think does a better job illustrating our bubble plots. So th these data come from a study that we did. It was actually a marketing study. Um, so there was a developer who was looking to build an off-strip Las Vegas boutique hotel. And so they asked and in, in, got us involved in terms of interviewing people who might be, you know, high, relatively high wealth, people who might be interested in such a hotel. And we just sort of, you know, spoke to them about what they would find um, attractive about something off-strip. And so these, if you look at the codes here, people talked about decor, they talked about luxury, luxury in the grounds, the rooms, the intimacy of the hotel itself, so, service, and so on. And so what we did in this study was we pulled out all of these excerpts, or I'm sorry, we pulled out all of the themes that sort of were coming out of the things that people were spontaneously reporting, and we applied weight systems. So everybody might have talked about um, service, some people would say how important that is to them. Other people say, yeah, you know, service is important, but it's not the, you know, not the number one deal breaker for me. Um, so there's variation in how people are talking about this. We were able to develop 10 point rating scales to index importance in their decision making about hotel choices. And I like this study because I think it does a great job of illustrating our bubble plots. All right, so here we're looking actually at four different dimensions. So we've got um, different codes so we can start looking at, okay, so people talked about warmth, they talked about luxury, and they talked about cost. And let's break this out by annual income, okay? So now the bubbles themselves represent um, the different income groups, and the, the, uh, the x-axis is how important warmth was. So for this group of less than $150,000 a year, um, warmth was moderately important. The y-axis is luxury. So that was much more important to them than the other groups. And the size of the bubble represents the importance of cost. So cost was important. Uh, luxury was particularly important and warmth less so for this particular subgroup. Okay. So this does a nice job of letting us look at variation across these multiple dimensions. And of course, like all of the visuals, click the, click the bubble and it pulls up the excerpts for you. All right. Um, and then we have the code frequency bubble plot. So here now we're not looking at importance, we're looking at how frequently we used a particular uh, code. Again, by subgroup. Okay, so it just gives us um, nice sort of marketing view. You know, marketing researchers love this because they want, you know, if they're developing a product, they want to know where's the space that, you know, their product will, will hit um, and target for particular subgroups. I mean, so what the, the developer in this study did was take a lot of the information and then when they were advertising in different magazines that, that they think might target people who are making less than $150,000 a year or the alternatively, the places that people who are making more than $250,000, they were able to actually pull on the voices of the actual research participants so that they could develop messaging that really resonated with the particular group they were looking at. Uh, all right, and finally, I'm going to take you to our Rita study. These are data from about 350. Um, users of or people who are familiar with qualitative data analysis software packages or research and evaluation data apps. And why are my data not appearing? Oh, here we go. Just took a little time to load. And um, so we've already looked at the, the um, 
numeric distribution for the code weights. Okay, we can also do that with any of our number fields. Okay, so if we look at single numbers, uh, sorry, I'm still becoming familiar with the the names for these new features. Oh, this is the grid chart. Sorry, I'm going to back out here. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, that's the bubble block. Sorry. You need somebody else to drive. And what am I looking for? It's a descriptor. Descriptor field. Oh, here we go. My apologies. All right, so this is ID. That's not going to be particularly useful. So for our weighted field or a number type fields here, we can then look at the distribution. Now here, as opposed to the code weight distribution, this is the distribution across a numeric field. So in this case, TRI stands for the Technology Readiness Index. So part of this survey included people completing a scale and again, we can change the segments. And so the higher end of this distribution are people that scored high on the total score who are sort of the early adopters of technology versus those at the lower end of the score. Um, and so we can then start to parse it out and start looking at, okay, so people who are at the really high end, um, here are all the excerpts from people who scored high on the score, for example, okay? So again, we're looking at a pure numeric distribution, in this case a descriptor field as opposed to a code weight, um, but we're parsing up our sample so that we can drill through and start looking at how people who sit in different places along this distribution may have responded to the you know to any of the things that we'd ask them in the survey, all the, all the open-ended questions. All right, so there's your single descriptor field. Now let's look at that same scale. We're going to do a look at a t-test. So was there differences in total technology readiness for males versus females? Okay, so here is, now it's not a huge sample, so that's why we get this kind of funky, uh, smoothed out distribution. Um, but you can see here the results of your t-test, degrees of freedom linked to critical value table. Um, so one of the things that was just really exciting to me um, as we finally built out these, these particular features, is we've been dealing with numbers um, since we launched Deduce or Ethnonotes, which was Deduce's predecessor uh, many years ago, but we weren't dealing with them in natural ways. So we weren't dealing with them in terms of continuous variables. Um, we would often segment and things like that based on different uh, ranges in the distribution. Okay, so these new features deal with numbers in purely natural ways. So we've got t-test built in, we have analysis of variance. So here we have your TRI total group. So we created groupings and then let's look at TRI total. And of course, for the very high, we have our group over here. And this is going to be a whoppingly significant group because it was a big cheat, right? So we created groups based across the distribution and looking at that same distribution. Um, but I think it does a great job of sort of illustrating uh, what we've done here. And then finally is your correlation scatter plot. So here is a subscale for the TRI scale, it's motivation. So what are those aspects of people reporting? And so we see that it looks like a pretty positive uh, correlation of 0.8. And one of the nice things about this is in terms of interaction is we can grab clusters of the scatter plot and it'll pull up those excerpts. So if we want to look at people who are at the high end and the things that they said about the open-ended questions, super easy to grab them. And then, of course, we might then compare that to people in the middle or look at what outliers were saying. Um, okay.
So I think we have covered the vast majority of what you're going to find in terms of analysis. And again, I know that this was a lot to, to digest all at once. Um, so let me stop and see if anybody has questions. Uh, Michael's asking about, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, Michael's asking about um, open coding using word counts. Okay, so so here's the deal. Um, a lot of people have asked us about automated coding in Deduce, and I know that this is possible in some of the other software packages. It's something that we have always been really uncomfortable with because um, ultimately they are, unless you know we've missed something they're based on the frequency of words and natural language is just more complicated than that um, there are actually industry specific uh, libraries that have been built out so if you're you know dealing with hotels there's um, services that will automatically analyze data for you and when my our developers actually found one of these many years ago and it, they have a sample data set on the website it took me about five minutes to find um, some true error that was introduced using this technique so in terms of auto coding the heads up is that we've been working with computer scientists for about um, God, no, three four years now um, and we're working towards developing something based on what's called topic models Okay, so if you're familiar with, um, uh, no, I'm absolutely blanky, but with um, uh, machine learning and um, what the topic modeling actually does, it's like factor analysis, I guess, is probably the best way to describe it if you're familiar with those techniques. So with factor analysis, we've got all these responses to scale items, for example, and we're trying to reduce that set of 100 items into some uh, set of factors that make sense to us based on the way that people have responded to the different questions. So similarly with language, people use particular words together. Okay, so it's not just word frequency, but topic modeling is based more on the, the, the probability that two words are going to occur together in a particular statement or document is what they call them. So a topic modeling machine learning engine uses algorithms that exist. We're using one called the latent Dirichlet allocation. And it the what the, the algorithm does is it tears through all of the words in, in a whole corpus of corpus of information. And you can say, hey, give me five topics. And so it will generate topics based on the word cluster probabilities, if I'm explaining that correctly. Um, and um, what we believe is that this should be something that's controllable. So what we've done is, it, or we have, we have a working prototype that's outside of Deduce, but what it allows you to do is to make decisions about, um, you know, where the, the allocation was accurate in terms of your human interpretation and where it wasn't. And so you can move things around, you can split topics and do all of that. In the same way, if you think about, we train our, our graduate assistants to help us um, in doing coding, but we train them up on the on the code system, right? When to use codes, when not to, what's you know necessary and sufficient conditions. So in the same way that we're training our, our assistants, we're training an algorithm. So every time you, you give the algorithm feedback, it learns from that and then it reruns it. And if you get it to a place where you're satisfied, you can then let it tear through the rest of your data. Um, so it's something that, um, we think is a little bit closer to the complexity of natural language in, in ways that we can take advantage of these mathematical formulas, but also supervise the algorithm because we do believe, particularly with qualitative data and how we as humans understand it, that we need to have a certain amount of control over that whole process. So there's 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 the, the long answer to your question, Michael. Um, Kendra's asking if uh, about information about audio files. Yeah, ultimately, we're talking about um, you know the the relationships between codes, um, between the subgroups in our descriptor sets, and the excerpts that we create, whether they're um, audio, video, text. It it all works in very similar ways. Uh, let me see. And Anna's asking about coding. Um, 
yeah, we can take that offline, Anna. I mean, we just went into our qualitative data with the with the um, you know in, in any example where we use the code way, and within each of the the interview responses, people would talk about these different things, and they would also somehow express how particularly important or unimportant it was for their making a decision about um, a, a hotel decision. And and yeah, there's um, and, and you make a good point here. Um, if you're in dealing with data where you can't reliably distinguish 10 points on a scale, you don't want to go there. High, medium, and low is fine. You just have three points on the scale. So again, with deduce, those are completely customizable. And so, Michael, no, I would not say that there is no value to word counts in qualitative analysis. I just think you have to be really careful about depending on them um, in, in the analysis itself and, and really in the same way that we look at frequencies of codes uh, across different subgroups, we need to be careful not to overinterpret something um, based on what might just be an artifact of the way that particular people talk. So that would be how I would respond to that. All right. So any other questions? Um, you know, and I mentioned all the different resources at the beginning. Um, I have recorded the session, so uh, I'll, I will get it processed and then shoot you all the notes so that uh, if you'd like to review it, you can um, do that at a later time. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. I hope this is, uh, certainly it goes into much more depth um, than in our typical demo webinar. So I hope I've given you a, a good flavor for what's in here. And then as we've talked, you know, the, the light bulbs went off for each of you in, um, you know, seeing things that are going to be useful for you in, in your work. And Irene is asking, top of modeling, uh, will that be able to read? That's a good question. Spelling mistakes. It's sometimes based on roots. Um, but that's a good question, Irene. We're going to have to take that up with the, the, the computer scientists who are, are helping us out. Um, I think it's going to be really difficult you know, with foreign languages, unfortunately. Um, but we'll see. Uh, and Michael's asking if we have any particular resources on the site that we recommend. You know, really, it just depends. There are video tutorials up there. Um, they're quite dated. We have, we're in the process now. Actually, we just finished a major introductory script. So we're going to be redoing these because unfortunately for our relatively small team, we're, we're, we're evolving to do a whole lot faster than we can keep up with in terms of putting the user guide together and all of that. So uh, the user guide has been fully revamped. Um, I do, uh, it's available through our website. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning, there are these little video snippets. So, not, so we're not just talking about how to create a code, for example. There'll, there'll be a little GIF in there that you can just click on so you can actually see what it looks like. Um, so our support team is, is very focused on uh, putting as many of these resources out as possible. Um, so I would say, you know, poke around there if you have particular questions. Um, Pay attention to our blog. Uh, we we are educators and researchers um, at our core, so you know we're not just writing about deduce stuff. We're writing about methods and best practices, at least as we understand them. So we're trying to you know provide a, a richer uh, set of resources that may be useful to you. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully you'll find your way. If not. Just give our support team a shout, and they will they will help you. We've got some really talented guys, especially um, I just always think of Jose in Excel. He's just masterful. So he you know people will come with these kind of interesting, complicated problems, and he'll just design a template for them. And yeah, so whenever there's a question like like that, it's just like I'm, I'm calling out Jose on this one. All right. Well, thank you, Irina, and everybody for joining. Um, yeah, and if you're not already a deduce user, please uh, give it a go. It's um, you know people are, are come to us you know at my lab at UCLA and say hey, which software should I use, and you know I'll be the first one to encourage them to put their hands on different tools to see what's most comfortable. Um, we're proud of what we've done with deduce, and we'll continue to continue to build it out. Um, and uh, you know sometimes it's just not the right tool for for everybody. Um, but if uh, Oh, and then lastly, what I should say is um, if you are part of a larger group, 
um, that's beginning to use Deduce or is consider considering adoption, please reach out to our support team. We'll set up a private webinar so that we can have, you know, like I'm, I'm actually doing one tomorrow for a particular research group uh, at Boston College. So they, they, they contacted us and said, you know, they wanted to have a focused conversation on what their needs are. And so we're happy to do that at no cost. It's just part of, you know, our supporting the research community overall. All right, so if there's not anything else, I'm going to sign us all off and wish you all a great rest of your day wherever you are, hopefully warm. We are here in Southern California. It's a little overcast today, but uh, I have two boys who live in the Midwest, so they're, they're wearing their, their jackets right now. <laughs> all right, take care all. Thank you.